Shall we start with the prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, O oh, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Come, O Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them for the fire of thy love. Amen. Amen. Great, gentlemen. Thanks for coming on again. Appreciate it. I'm going to continue on with uh, the true devotion by St. Louis Montfort. Again, if you have any, any comments or things you'd like to ask, just stop me at any time. I have some uh, discussion questions uh, put in here, too, as well. To, we'll continue on. Today, I'd like to talk about the fundamental truths of devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, what is it that we believe about devotion to Mary? And um, the first point is this. St. Louis de Montfort's very clear that Jesus Christ is the end of all devotion. And so our devotion to Mary um, ultimately must lead to Jesus or it's a false devotion. St. Louis de Montfort says that there's no other name by which we can be saved. That Jesus, we're only saved through Jesus Christ. There's only one mediator between God and man. And again, I kind of shudder because uh, I'm going to be talking about a mediatrix in a second, but this is very true. That um, Jesus Christ must be the end of all of our devotion. He says this in paragraph 61. Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Savior, true God and true man, ought to be the last end of all of our other devotions, else they are false and delusive. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things. If it is not in him alone, that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessing and benediction, and he is our only master who has to teach us, our only Lord on whom we ought to depend, our only head to whom we must be united, our only model to whom we should conform ourselves, our only physician who can heal us, our only shepherd who can feed us, our only way who can lead us, our only truth whom we must believe, our only life who can inanimate us, and are only all in all things who can satisfy us. There has been no other name given under heaven except the name of Jesus by which we can be saved. God has laid no other foundation of our salvation. So that's the first principle of a true devotion to Mary, is Jesus Christ is the end. And Mary, he's the, he's, the, he's the remote end. Mary is the proximate end of our true devotion. That's why we say we're going to do Jesus through Mary. So we must keep that in the back of our mind. We must promote devotion so that we can ultimately... More people can be devoted to Jesus. So that's that's our that's the fundamental um, principle. But yet he says something very powerful and very staggering. He says, um, and it repeats what we said last time, that Our Lady is the proximate end of our of our of our devotion. And so the rest of the time we're going to be talking about this proximate end. Of devotion. He says this in paragraph 62. If then we establish solid devotion to Our Lady, it is only to, to establish more perfectly devotion to Jesus Christ and to provide an easy 
is secure, sure, perfect a means of finding Jesus Christ. He says this about Our Lady, which is very staggering. Ah, if we only knew. This is in paragraph 63. Ah, if we only knew the glory and the love which thou receivest in this admirable creature, Our Lady, we should have very different thoughts of both of thee and her. And that's what I'm hoping to get across last time and today. If we only knew how pleased God is with the glory that Mary gives to Jesus, we'll see them both differently. She is so intimately united with thee that it would be easier to separate light from the sun. Mary and Jesus are so closely united, it'd be easier to, to rip light from the sun than to, to break the unity between Our Lady and Jesus. The heat than heat from fire. Nay, get this, it would be easier to separate God from all the angels and the saints than the divine Mary. It'd be easier to, to strip the angels from God or the saints than to take Mary, separate them. Or Mary is more closely united to Jesus than all the angels and the saints combined. Because she loves thee more ardently and glorifies thee more perfectly than all creatures put together. And so when we see her in this context, it, it makes perfectly good sense that if we're going to try to unite and promote a devotion to Jesus, that it's going to be built on a devotion to Our Lady. Okay. So the next point, um, and you can stop me at any time, is to talk about slavery really a politically correct topic today. Um, I, I'm convinced, uh, persuaded by St. Louis de Montfort, and I'm comfortable by calling myself a slave. And the more I am comfortable with that, the more united, the more consecrated I feel I am to Our Lady. And so if you, hopefully I can communicate that um, to be at peace with that, to be at peace, tell him and not apologize for it at all. And you're going to see why in a moment. First of all, he talks about types of slavery and he makes a distinguished, he makes a distinction between servants and slavery. He says this in paragraph 69 about the difference between a servant and a slave. He says, um, a servant um, is someone who engages himself to serve another during a certain time at a certain rate of wages or recompense. A slave is entirely dependent on another during his whole life and must serve his master without claiming any salary or rate wages or reward. Just as one of his beasts, sounds pretty radical, over which he has the right of life and death. So one is owned. A slave is owned by a master. A servant is entitled to a salary, a wage. That is very radical in this um, uh, the world we live in, this liberal world we live in. Um, but it's so true. Um, not that I'm advocating slavery at all. He says this in paragraph 71. A little more distinction between servants and slaves. A servant does not give all he is, all he has, and all he can acquire by himself or another to his master. But the slave gives him whole, himself whole and entire, all he has and all he can acquire without any exception. Servant owns things to himself. He gets a wage. He owns a house. The slave has nothing. He doesn't even have himself. The servant demands wages for his services, which he performs. The slave 
demands nothing whatsoever. The servant can leave his master when he wants to. He can go find another master, or at least when his service expires, when the contract is over. But the slave has no right to quit his master at will. The master of the servant has no right of life and death over him, so that if he should kill him like one of his beasts of burdens, he would not be committing an unjust homicide. But the master of the slave has by law a right of life and death over him, so that he may sell him to anybody he likes. Now he's speaking about uh, law in that time. And so there's limitations um, when you're a servant. It's un there's no limitations of servitude when you are a slave. Very important distinction. Um, then he says there's three types of slavery. There's a slavery by nature, a slavery by force, or constraint, and a slavery by will, by choice. A slavery by, um, let's read this passage here in 71. A slavery, a slavery by nature would be like us. We are slaves to God as creatures, not as, not as baptized. Well, we are slaves baptized, but we're slaves, um, but that's by choice. We're slaves by by nature to God because he made us. He owns us because without him making us, we wouldn't be here. That's an example of slavery by nature. Then there's slavery by force. The demons and the devils and the damned are slaves by force. They're compelled by God um, in, the, in the pit of hell. Um, and our slaves, they, uh, God can command them to do whatever he asks, or he can give that power to Our Lady or to his bishops or to whom the bishops uh, designate as exorcists. And when they command, they are commanding by force. Um, that's what the commanding prayer is all about. Then there's slaves by choice. And we have great examples of this slavery by choice. Um, first, we have Jesus himself. I'm going to read a passage real quickly from the Dewey Reims Bible. It's Philippines, uh, the, Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. He says this, For let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. Other translations, a slave, being made in the likeness of men and in the habit found as a man. So we have Jesus himself taking slavery himself as a slavery of choice. And he made himself a slave of all of humanity, even though he didn't have to do it. And he didn't uh, empty himself of his divinity at all. He emptied himself, but not of his, he didn't change who he was. St. Um, uh, John uh, Chrysostom says, God left heaven, but he, he, he descended, but he never, he never left. Like he, he, when he, in the incarnation, he, he remained unchanged in heaven, but he also came. It's a mystery, the incarnation. But in the, in the, in the, as a man, um, he emptied himself um, while, while not changing. It's a mystery. In a mystery, retaining all that he was, he also emptied himself and became a slave. That right there starts to persuade me um, in slavery. Uh, this slavery of choice. Then we have um, Our Lady in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 38. Um, she says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Um, in Greek, it's, it's uh, doulos, or uh, doulia, uh, yeah, something about doulos. I'd have to look it up again. But it's basically servant or slave. Our Lady considered herself to be a slave of God. 
um, when her response to to God's plan from the angel Gabriel. So she identifies herself as a slave. <laughs> I'm even more persuaded about this slavery of choice. St. Paul himself, uh, probably, let me tell you how many times in the in um, in his epistles, he refers to himself as a slave um, uh, half a dozen times um, as a slave. Um, yeah. So it's okay to be a slave of Jesus and Mary. Even the Council of Trent itself um, speaks about the slavery, the slavery of Jesus Christ. Um, it says this from the Council of Trent. Um, the Mon Moncipia Christi, the slave of Jesus Christ. That is in, um, from the Catechism, the Roman Catechism, um, the second uh, Symboli Articulo, uh, chapter 3, paragraph 1, IA. So it's from the Roman Catechism, the Manit. Mancipia Christi, the slave of Jesus Christ. So we should be at peace about being a slave of Christ. And and because of these truths that we've talked about, and I'm going to give you this amazing uh, truth about Our Lady in a second. It's another one of those singers like we had last time. Um, he's like, if, you, if, you, if you're hung up on slave of Mary, I give up. If you don't want to call yourself a slave of Mary, call yourself a slave of Christ, but you're going to be a slave of Mary anyway because they're so closely united. And so I would say let's be at peace about speaking about ourselves as slaves. I don't know if you guys have any comments about that, but it uh, depends on the audience. What do you think, Brad? You born, you born into this world a slave to something. Right? A slave to your passions, a slave to your desires. Yeah. A slave, yeah. A slave to the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> we so, do, we do use, yeah. That's a great so point. Who your master is, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, so, two questions. The Roman Catechism, is that the Council of Trent? Catechism, yeah, it's a catechism that St. Robert Bellman wrote and was commissioned by the Council of Trent. Yeah, it's the one Bishop Schneider was teaching um, on the broadcast. Um, yeah. So if I've got a catechism of the Council of Trent, that is the Roman Catechism? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the second thing is, so this is something I've been wrestling with and why we're talking about this topic as we go through the consecration here. Because I think at one point, uh, Louis de Montfort says, basically, anything you have, when you do this, when you make yourself a slave of Mary, you give to her everything, yeah. all your possessions, all your spiritual merits. Yes. And I know she's a divine and merciful mother, but it's something like my pride, I think, is wrestling with right now. Yeah. Like, yeah. why do I, then do I ask for anything in prayer? Because yeah. Yeah. Mary's just going to... Yeah. Well, like I'm afraid I'm going to fall into this like complacency or indifference or something. And yeah. It's something I'm also that's pride. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you deal with that? Because I know you've made this kind yeah, of I Yeah. I, I wrestle. I wrestle. I wrestle with it too. I mean, do I, um, when I get a plenary indulgence, do I keep it to myself or do I give it to Our Lady? Because, um, uh, I I would like to not I would like to have that plenary indulgence. God God knows God knows I need it. Um, but Saint Louis de Montfort is going to address this not today, but he'll address it on in the next lecture. Um, he's going to break up our works into two things: the salvific aspect of the re, the reward of our work, and then the merits and. Um, you always retain when, she, when we give her our treasure that we're storing up. So when we do a fasting, or we do a penance, or a plenary indulgence, we get to retain uh, the salvific merit, and she safeguards that. But we can, and she holds that for us. When we give it to her, she still keeps it for us. But we can give up the um, 
the meritorious aspects of her work, and she could, we can give it to her to apply however she wants. And so if we cast ourselves without reservation, um, um, then um, there's no looking back. I mean, then we know that actually um, uh, our Lord will be more pleased with it, that it will be safeguarded, and that in the economy of God's salvation, it will be best used. Um, does that mean we pray for things? Sure, we can still pray for things. Um, when we pray a rosary, um, do we just give our rosary to her? Yeah, we do. But we can also have intentions. Um, um, it's, it's a mystery because God is inviting us to be um, little co-redeemers. Um, so we can offer things up in love and, and do that at the same time. And I don't have a good answer for that, but um, the more we um, the more we enter into that mystery of literally um, not not keeping anything at all, um, the more we want to do it, and the more it'll make sense. I don't know if that's a good answer. Can you restate that distinction? So it was celibatic marriage yeah. versus uh, a meritorious. Yeah, I'll save it for next time because I'll explain okay. it better next time. But. But he makes that distinction, and I think that that helps us to understand. One, it helps us understand that we have to work out our salvation, that we actually work, um, or so we work our salvation. It's a fact, and that these works have value, and that we can retain, or we can give them to Our Lady, or entrust them into the hands of Our Lady. Um, like, let me give you an example. Uh, when I run, like I run. Um, in uh, Spartan races and stuff, and so I run. And I can I can give up, like I run ten miles, for example. I can I used to give that each mile up for different intentions, like you know, like um, I'll give this mile up for my wife. I'll give this mile up for my children. I'll give this for this intention. Now I don't do that. I just give it all to Our Lady. Um, and I used to, I used to didn't, I used it was hard for me to come to the point of accepting that. But now I'm like, it makes perfectly good sense. Why wouldn't I not give up that for her and give it to her? Because she's going to, my, I'm still, my best intentions are still tainted with, with self-love. But if I give it to her, she perfects it, brings it into herself, protects my my treasure that I'm storing up for my own personal salvation, and she optimizes um, what I do to make it so pleasing to God that it it becomes um, uh, amazing. It's a great question. So going back to the idea of slavery, we use slave. We are slaves to the IRS. I like that. We really are. We pay, we pay, I don't know what we pay, 30%. Like we don't make money for ourselves until April or May. And so from, May, from January, February, March, we're slaves. <laughs> That's just a fact. <laughs> so in a certain sense, um, that, 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 that can help uh, people understand this idea of slavery. Um, I don't think it's an issue of whether we're slaves or not. It's just an issue of who we're going to be a slave to. St. Louis de Montfort says we're either a slave of, of Satan or we're going to be a slave of Jesus Christ. And so we just have to get over the idea. If we don't like the word slave, got to get over it and just talk about it. Because I think it will help us realize how demanding and how the consecration is how demanding the true devotion is and i think i think this year when i made the consecration in may with my people here um that's the big lesson the big takeaway that i got out of this year's consecration is is i've really entered into that mystery and received the fruits of it in a new new way and so i encourage all of us to be at peace with that word. Um, let me see what else I can say. Um, paragraph 74. This is the singer I want to give you um, about Our Lady. Um, I'll just read it. And we can marvel at 
who our lady is. That's part of part of what I'm trying to do is talk about what the consecration is. And part of it, I'm trying to talk about who this lady is, this woman, the mother of God. And we're going to learn more now about her. Would I absolutely say absolutely of Jesus Christ? I say relatively, relatively of Our Lady. What he's saying here is uh, in a moment is that Mary, uh, God has all the divinity as God by nature, but Mary has all of God's divinity that she can bear even though she's an infinite creature, by grace. And so she, God, when we get certain saints, in a certain sense, we can speak about a divine Mary. I mean, it has to be explained, but it's explained in this way. God, again, has everything, all of his divinity, omnipotence, almighty power, omniscience, all goodness, justice, mercy, truth, and everything by nature, by the very fact of who he is. But he has decided to give it to Our Lady, all that she could bear as a finite creature. And she increases in capacity. She has it by grace. And so um, we need to ponder that as I read this here. When I say absolutely of Jesus Christ, absolutely, I say relatively of Our Lady. Since Jesus Christ chose her for the inseparable companion the word companion is important. That's what he means by the woman, by the co-redemptrix. It's his collaborator, his companion in the work of salvation, the companion of his life, he says here. He chose her as the inseparable companion of his life, of his death, of his glory, and of his power in heaven and upon the earth. He gave her by grace relatively to his majesty, all the same rights and privileges which he possesses by nature. He gave all of the power that he could give her, all of his rights, all of his privileges, all the everything um, that he possesses by nature, he gave it to her by grace. All that is fitting to God by nature is fitting to Mary by grace, say the saints, so that according to them, Mary and Jesus, having but the same will and the same power, have also the same subjects, servants, and slaves. It's one kingdom. We speak about the reign of Mary, and we speak about Christ the King, but it's really one kingdom. But in God's plan, he wants to establish the reign of Mary first. He wants his queen to go ahead, just like he did in the incarnation. And so when we speak about the slaves of Christ, they're the slaves of Mary. It's the same thing because of who Mary is, because she has everything by grace, what God has by nature. That's who this. That's who we're consecrating ourselves to. This companion, inseparable companion of his life, his death, and his glory, and of his power. That's what he means in the Bible by the woman. That's what he means. What does it mean when he says in the wedding feast of Canaan? What is it between you and me, woman? My hour has not come. You know, that's what he's. He's not really saying I don't want to do this. He's just raising this idea of. What's about to happen? So uh, that that if we tie that to slavery, in that sense of the word, a slave of Jesus is a slave of Mary. So, but he says, if you're still hung up on slave of Mary, uh, then just for heaven's sakes, go with slave of Jesus Christ. He's he's not going to push it. This is, <laughs> so this is he, he's not going to have much patience for it, uh, but. Yeah, he's not going to push it. So now we'll move on and talk about um, uh, the mediatrix. It's very powerful. Yeah. Okay. It's more humble. To go to a mediator through a mediatrix, it requires more humility. 
And if we really reflect on who we are, our best intentions still, and at least I can say this about myself, still have traces and taints of pride or self, kinds of self-love, no matter what it is. And even in the work of the apostolate, if I, if I really honestly examine my conscience, I will find traces of, of, of selfishness, of pride or whatever it is. Um, and who, even though Jesus assumed a human nature, he never stopped being the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And so our sinfulness is still sinfulness and imperfections uh, in the presence of Jesus because he's God. And so when we reflect and look at Jesus that way and we say, I am a sinner still, and you are God, and even though you are the divine mercy, even though you're the the, um, uh, the sacred heart, you have a sacred heart and love for us, a tender love for us, I look at you and I want to go through a mediatrix to go to the mediator. It's more humble to acknowledge that, to say I am a sinner and you are uh, oh, the Holy One that I, I can't, that when Moses had to had to take off his shoes, the angels closed their eyes. The seraphim used their six wings to hide their eyes at the glory of God. And when I look at myself and hold myself against the divinity of the second of Jesus, I'm like, yeah, I should use, I should go through a mediatrix to go to you because it's more humble. And so I'll read the quote in paragraph 83. He says this. It is more perfect because it is more humble not to approach God of ourselves without taking a mediator. Our nature, as I've just shown, is so corrupted that if we rely on our own works, efforts, and preparations in order to reach God and please Him, it is certain that our good works will be defiled or will be of little weight before God in inducing Him to unite Himself to us. So when we look at the reality of ourselves, it's more... It's more perfect and more humble to go through a mediatrix. Secondly, as I said before, our greatest actions and intentions are tainted with self-love. They are. And so they're not as pleasing as we think they are to God. And so it's more humble to say, I'm going to give this to you, Our Lady, so that you can, you can perfect it and make it pleasing to God. Uh, St. Louis de Montfort uses this analogy of a farmer who wants to give an apple to a king. And uh, it's, it's, it's his best apple from his orchard. And if he just gave it to the king, the king would be like this peasant is giving me an apple and I've got a feast in front of me. But if the queen that is sitting next to him takes the apple from the peasant, puts it on a platter, and then hands that apple on a, on that golden platter, that apple becomes takes on a new status of excellence, and he wants he is so pleased to see and delight at that apple. That's what Our Lady does with all of our works; she perfects them, and and puts her stamp, uh, her personality into them, arranges it. Maybe she garnishes that platter and makes it beautiful uh, for the king. So St. Louis de Montfort says, again, in paragraph 85, let us say boldly with St. Bernard that we have need of a mediator with the mediator, capital M. Let us say, let's be comfortable with that. Let, I'll say it again. Let us say boldly with St. Bard, Bernard that we have a need of a mediator with a mediator. <laughs> this, this would kill the Protestants. I mean, they just... We're not, because they say we have one mediator. We have one mediator between God and man. That's in the Bible. St. Paul says that. We do. We have or it's in the book of Hebrews, maybe. I can't remember. We have one mediator. That's true. We're not denying that. Jesus is the one mediator. But what we're saying is, is that we do have a need for a mediator, a mediatrix with a small M with that mediator. It's more humble for the reasons that I outlined. 
And the Protestants, Protestants for heaven's sakes, still rely on other mediators, don't they? Even though they say they, they have one mediator, they still rely on other mediators, don't they? <laughs> this one guy did, did, did a debate with... The, somebody's going to say something. Go ahead. Somebody going to say something? Ah, um, this one Protestant was in a debate with um, uh, a Catholic, and the Catholic said, you know, would you pray for me about my wife or kids? And he said, sure, I will. <laughs> and why why do other Protestants, if we, why don't they just go to Jesus, the one mediator? Why do they ask for prayers of each other on the earth or prayers from their quote-unquote pastor? You know, why do they do that? Because we know. Um, that is perfect and pleasing to God. Especially, we know that the prayers of a holy man, of a just man, is very pleasing to God. If that's true, how more pleasing is the, is His Queen, the Queen of Heaven? And so, um, um, yeah. So. Let me find the quote I was going to give. What's that? What's that? I was just wondering. We have a couple of ex-Protestants in the room here. I just recently ex-Protestants. So I was kind of curious what their thoughts were. Yeah, yeah. Can you give me some feedback on that? Yeah. <laughs> challenge is just uh, somewhere deep inside me and so this this does you know it does make a much more sense right I mean if you have uh, Mary who by grace has the power of God and is at the, the hand of God is the handmaid of God as she says in Luke um, she is asking for prayers uh, you know think of the power of that relative to the power of uh, us and, and I think maybe maybe there's some opportunity for us to say rosaries for each other right and, and um, through through Mary right uh, use that power rather than the, uh, the you know the, the human power so not very well articulated but uh, I agree with, with what Jason says it does make sense from given given that it sounds like the truth and I, and I think the two points the the idea that anything we can do to humble ourselves we need constant 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 reminders to do that um, and number two your your sort of depiction of myself presenting an app my best apple to the yeah. king yeah. I mean that's that was really powerful to me yeah. Just, yeah. Well, when you think in terms of the monarchy, too, you know, you never had access to the king unless you had patrons, you know, so that's just in that sense, it's like, yeah. you need know, to go to the king. I, I've gotten to the point, though, where it's like, I'm unworthy to approach Mary, you know, like, especially with all this stuff you're teaching me. So. <laughs> Mary, the, the, the thing St. Louis de Montfort says about Mary, she is all mercy. God is perfect uh, justice and perfect mercy, but Mary is all mercy. And if, if we use a mediatrix, it doesn't take away the tender love of our Savior for us in the sacred heart of Jesus. It's just using a mediatrix is, 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 is acknowledging the, the, the reality of who we are and who, who Jesus is. And he'll be more he'll be more pleased with that. But it doesn't want to take don't want to take away from the mystery of his of his tender love from the sacred heart. So it's, it's all things in balance. But um, yeah, she is uh, 
it's good to think that way. I think that way too. That she is much um, more powerful than I realized, really, in Catholic teaching. And uh, I suffered under decades of Mary minimalism, being an American Catholic, just like you guys. And they never talk about this stuff. Even in Vatican II, I'm really annoyed by um, the fact that they had to put her in a chapter instead of giving her her own um, document like they discussed. But even if you read it, they just speak of her as a model Christian, mother of the church, not the woman, not the co redemptrix I mean, they mention it in a small way, but they really don't develop her, who she really is, as this inseparable companion, collaborator with the, with the salvation of mankind. We need that. We really need uh, the Pope to finish, the, to finish it off and give the infallible pronouncement on the co redemptrix will really help uh, the church a lot. And it will happen one day. I'm going to talk about false devotions now. I've got to, let me just read this one quote, and then we'll move to the false devotions. Um, so he says this here about the world. So we don't get arrogant about our own actions. He says this, the world is so corrupt that it seems inevitable the religious hearts be soiled, if not by its mud, at least by its dust. And so I believe that's where we are. If we don't get mud on ourselves, we're at least going to get dust on ourselves. It is something of a miracle for anyone to stand firm in the midst of this raging torrent and not be swept away to weather the stormy sea and not be drowned or robbed by pirates, to breathe this pestilential air and not be contaminated by it. It is Mary, the singularly faithful virgin over whom Satan had never any power, who works this miracle for those who truly love her. And so um, our final point on ourselves, our weakness, and our our tainted uh, selves is that we, we give it to her. One of the blessings of the consecration is that in this perverse, evil, wicked, transgendered, homosexual, disgusting, everything, lustful, all the, all the above, she will keep us safe, keep our hearts pure, and we can start to walk the path of her, of her giving us a little bit of her purity in our hearts. We're going to move on now and talk about false devotions. Um, to understand what a true devotion is, we must know what the false devotions are. I'll fly through them pretty quickly in the last 10 minutes, and then we'll start um, next week on talking about true devotions, or the true devotion. Um, there are seven false devotions. The first one is a critical devotion. These people say they don't like miracles. They're skeptics, and they don't like when the people say, our lady appears here and there, or our lady uh, cries in a statue, or our lady um, <laughs> came and made the sun dance. And they don't, they just think, we better just focus on Jesus and just leave this private revelation stuff aside. Private revelation is just private revelation. You don't have to believe it, so don't really focus on it. And so, um, I don't know. I don't know if you've encountered that one before, critical devotees or people uh, that would minimize the miraculous or or not get into approved uh, private revelation like Fatima or Lourdes or a lady of, you probably heard of that before, maybe a priest in a homily or something like that, maybe. That's critical devotees. I see that everywhere. Um, uh, all the modernist heretics I think this way uh, if, they, if they give any space to Our Lady 
Then you have the scrupulous. This is the second one. Scrupulous devotees. These are people that are super afraid that you can say too much about Our Lady, um, that you'll be taking away from Jesus. <laughs> they, they get freak out if people spend time in front of Our Lady statue and not in front of the Blessed Sacrament. <laughs> As if giving devotion to Our Lady is robbing Jesus and offending our Lord. Jesus, let me tell you, Jesus is not offended at all. Um, if we give devotion to Our Lady, he's very pleased. So, But there are people like that. Um, they, they tell people, don't pray the rosary uh, before Mass. You know, they, you should talk. A lot of the modernist priests, you should talk and be conversational because uh, we are a community. And they try to just detract from um, uh, uh, they, they try to cut the rosaries out before mass um, so those two I think are very um, prevalent in America then we have external devotees um, these people pray many rosaries they go to processions they um, uh, wear the scapular uh, they do all kinds of external devotions but they but they don't convert they don't it doesn't change their lives they don't be, start to become like our lady they don't it does nothing sinks in here at all and so they're all busy busy praying rosaries praying novenas to our lady bringing her flowers doing the processions all these things having a may altar in their home uh, but nothing sinks in those are external devotees. Then we have presumptuous devotees. This goes back to the stories in the Middle Ages. Um, like Our Lady does in the last hour of our death, Our Lady can be there and come to us, give us the grace to convert and, and help us because we prayed to her in her life. And that does happen. There are many sinners that have lived immoral lives for 99.9% .9 of their lives, and in the last second, turn to Our Lady and are saved. That's very true. But the presumptuous say, uh, I'll pray, say a few rosaries, and I'll keep on living in adultery, or I'll keep fornicating, I'll keep um, living a life of crime, whatever it is. You know, like the mafia, for example. They wear scapulars, they pray the rosary, and then they go out and do the work that mafia does. Those are presumptuous. It's, it's ridiculous and offensive to Our Lady of Sorrows who held the crucified body of her son um, to think that she's going to have any patience for that. And so those are the presumptuous. Then there's the hypocritical. These are evil, evil men. They fake devotion to Our Lady. They speak piously about Our Lady. They... Uh, speak very, in a very holy way. Um, they may even uh, they may even lead people to convert through their pious words, and their their words of uh, their their words might even motivate people to uh, be saved or convert. And, but but they use it for their own evil intentions, for uh, abusing uh, people, children, women, whatever abusing the weak, they're false shepherds or false people, false Catholic speakers who fake a devotion. Um, I've, I've seen that before. Um, I, I really didn't want to be a speaker. Like, I really honestly didn't even want to come and speak <laughs> in Wisconsin uh, because I do, I hate Catholic speakers with a passion. I, 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 um, I'm going on record in that for saying that, but it's really true. I've been in a lot of I went to the Catholic Identity Conference, okay? It's a very traditional Catholic conference. Bishop Snyder goes there. It's in Pittsburgh every year in October. And this guy spoke about Our Lady of Fatima. And I'm not going to say who he is. But after the conference that evening on Friday in the hotel, he was in a bar with his shirt opened up and his hairy chest sticking out with a gold chain. And he was just drinking, sitting at the bar. And I thought, that, that's, that's way different than what Our Lady of Fatima, uh, um, that, that, that doesn't, that can't, that's not going to, 
coexist. Those two things don't go together, you know. And so um, that's why I don't like Catholic speakers. I've seen too many of them. You can see them. Uh, they sound all great when they're in front of a podium, but if you go to a conference and see how they really are, it's, um, uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that of everyone, you know, but there are some that are fall in this category of hypocritical. So I'm not knocking it all together. I just, um, um, I hope I'm balancing out what I'm saying, but uh, I'm a little uh, skeptical of, of Catholic speakers. <clears throat> Um, anyway, um, next one is interested devotees. <laughs> if you ever pray to God, you, you procrastinated for your final exam and you waited to the last second to study for your exam and then you prayed a rosary that you get an A on the exam. That's what an interested devotee is. These devotees, Our Lady, uh, wants something from her. And well, Our Lady wants to give us everything, not just the holy th spiritual things she wants to give us good things she at the wedding feast of cana she wanted to give several hundred gallons of wine to the guests at the at the uh, at the wedding and that was a good good earthly thing and so she wants to give us the good things just like any loving mother would she knows what we need and is very very with a great empathetic love individually devoted to us and wants to give us earthly things but the interest of devotees pray to her lady. She gives them what, what they want, and then that's it. They, they disappear until the next thing they want. And some people may start that way. I think I did. Um, back when I was 18, I started that way. And so it's a good start. Um, but mustn't uh, get caught up in that one. And then the last one is, the, the seventh one is inconstant devotees. These are people that start the consecration. They do it for 33 days. They make it. They're all gong ho. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. And then they forget all together. And they uh, go back, so backslide you know, to their ways, to whatever level they were before. Um, whether it's mediocre or or worse. And so and then they, they get it again. They get back in a merry kind of mood or fad. And then they just backslide. So must guard against all of these um, and have the proper balance. But these are all seven false devotions of Our Lady. And we could see in our lives that different people might fit these different categories. We might have known people. Or if we look at ourselves, we might see weaknesses in ourselves, different ways where we fit into these categories. And so St. Louis de Montfort holds that out. Uh, to examine our conscience and to say, none of what I'm talking about is, is this, these seven things. Critical, um, the, the skeptics, scrupulous, those people that are worried about offending Jesus, external, those people that you know, are all focused on external devotions, the presumptuous, the hypocritical, and the interested in the inconstant. <laughs> Next week, um, I will uh, start talking about what a true devotion is. Um, I'll just say the words, and then we'll, I guess we can open to questions uh, if we have time. He says, a true devotion is interior, tender, holy, constant, and disinterested. So that's what we'll pick up next time. Anybody have questions or comments that they would like to wrap up or uh Oh, yeah. Morning with. I was going to say those. My thoughts on the, the four, the six or seven uh, <laughs> false devotions. Six, six, seven, seven. Um, but what I was trying to do is just examine my own conscience because I'm sure I've fallen into each of those categories, even now, you know, at times. So sure. something just to, to think about there. But what kept coming to my mind was the. Uh, Parable of the seed fall, where it fell on the ground. Yeah. Um, you know, that was kind of a thought that yeah. popped in my head when you were talking. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, was it the fifth where they, the, I don't remember the exact names of the categories, but the, the ones that can speak eloquently and then they're just using it for their own self interest. And 
I thought of uh, Donald World. I, I once uh, saw him speak for out of that man's view. He, they just had a video of him, and he just spoke so beautifully and eloquently about the gospel. I don't remember yeah. what gospel it was. Yeah. But then to find out two years later that he's just a criminal in the background. You know? Yeah. yeah. Bishop World? You talking about Bishop World? Yeah, it was just shocking yeah. how diabolical yeah. that was to me. Yeah. It was like, how can you speak so beautifully about yeah. Such a, yeah. You know, that's true. Yeah. Even 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 um even um Mr. McCarrick um uh would would uh, he he presented himself as a quote unquote conservative. Um and as 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 the guy that can track so many vocations. Like he's so uh holy and so conservative that um he is a vocation magnet. That's how he, he was perceived and presented. Yeah. There are there are those there. God have mercy on on them. Uh, yeah. There was a priest, a Jesuit priest, um, Father. He used to give the Ignatius exercise retreats back in the nineties, and I went on one of his retreats and he preached the, the holiest retreats he could ever imagine. And I really went deep in his spiritual life through his meditations. Um, he preached authentic Ignatian retreats and he was a criminal, a pedophile. At that time, I was preaching those retreats and after. It was a terrible thing. So, But he used it for his own and uh, there are people like that. But uh, over time, the, the the sheep will know by their by their fruits. Will know. You hang around them long enough. <laughs> you, you just go after the talk to the bars in the hotel. See if they're there. You could really see how they really are. So, some of them. <laughs> now, Scott Hahn, for example, I know him personally. He's the holiest guy, the humblest guy I've ever known. It really is. What's going on? He is. He's the real deal. So that should balance out when I talk about Catholic speakers. That's what should balance out because I know him. He goes to St. Peter's at the Latin Mass, same place as me, and he's very, very humble. Oh my, I've been in, I've talked with him, you know, just shoot the breeze with him many times. And he's just like somebody like him who knows so much we should talk all the, do all the talking all the time. But he just has this profound gift of listening to people. So humble. So, so. Shall we finish with a prayer? Yeah. 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 Right, please, and today it's being to the Son. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, the world without end. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Oh, and finally, if you do, let's get into the sun.